The King is risen and he is risen indeed. You are welcome in this place. You are welcome in our hearts. We worship you. Help. Let's sing in those days. Hey. I will pray when you pray. I will listen. I will listen. Help. If you look for me. If you know this, sing this out. It's Jeremiah 29, 11. Hey! Lord, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, John. They are plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. To give you a future and a hope. Give you a future and a hope. Give you a future. Days when you pray, I will listen. Hey, I will listen if you look for me. And then the Lord said, you will be in Babylon for 70 years. But then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised. Do you hear that, church? These are his promises. Every prayer you've prayed, every tear that you've cried, he's here to fulfill them. He's a good God that we serve. Welcome to New Hope Oahu, everywhere and anywhere. And contrary to popular belief, Easter has not been canceled. No, Jesus is risen, and he's still on the throne, and he lives forevermore. And by the way, as you know, we are in uncharted times, and everybody's a bit confused about what's happening in the world. But what's happening around us does not affect what happened 2,000 years ago on Calvary. Let me give you a word of encouragement. All through history, in every case, whenever the church has come under governmental or pandemic restrictions, the church has always come out shining brighter than ever before. We've always come through stronger, purer, more ignited, more on fire for Jesus. This is the stuff that revivals have been made of. This is when we ratchet back to our purpose on this earth. And the church rises from the ashes rather than being engulfed by them. 
God uses things like this to prune and to purge, and the ones who understand that will emerge more fruitful than ever before. We will arise, and we will overcome. Amen? Today's message is how to gain God's favor. This is a critical message for many of us and many who may be wondering about God's role in all of this. Stay with us. And by the way, do something eternal today. And one way is to call your friends to join you. Have them go to the address on your screen because it may very well be the most eternal decision they may ever make. And I love that, that truth that we are children of the living God. And I love thinking back to all the promises and the miracles, Father, that you have, that you have done, um, turning water into wine, uh, parting the Red Sea, Father, all these incredible things that you have done. They're just wonderful reminders that if you can do that, that you can do so much more. And there's so much more that you're going to do, Father. And so in this time, in this space, Father, we say thank you for the miracles that you have done. Thank you for the miracles to come. And thank you for the miracles that we are living in right now. We're so, so very, very thankful, Father. We're so very, very thankful. You are here.
encourage you right now, wherever you are, that whatever you might need, He will give that to you. He will provide that for you. He will heal you. He will grant you all the desires of your heart. Even if you can't see Him, even if you can't feel Him, He's working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working.
majestic and beautiful is your name. Oh, how we love you. We love being your people. And right now, Father, we cry out from the depths of our souls that we need you. Oh, how we want you, Father. Oh, how we need you to move in this space, move in our lives, move in our nation, move in our world, Father. We welcome you. And we thank you. And we are honored to be called your children. Oh, how we love you. We say all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Every week on Thursday morning by 7 a.m., my garbage man has been taking away my garbage. He takes it away without fail, rain or shine, snow or sleet. And sometimes I have some pretty foul-smelling stuff in the dumpster. In fact, once when our electricity went out, everything in our freezer spoiled. There was an unmistakable odor that would knock you over. But even though I tossed it all in, he took it all away without a whimper of complaint. But you know something? Till this day, even though he's been so faithful, I still don't know his name. And that seems a little criminal, I know. And I don't know a thing about him. But let me ask you this. What if he didn't just take away my garbage? What if he also scrubbed out the can with soap and water and rinsed it out for me? Now, that would be amazing. I think at that point, I'd like to at least know his name. But come with me just one step further. What if he didn't just take away my garbage? What if he then washed the can out, rinsed it, filled it then with food, and put money on top of it? Let me tell you, I would really like to get to know his name. In fact, I'd like to get to know him more and more. Why? Because he just might have more goodies in store. <laughs> but that's exactly how Jesus is to you and to me. He's so faithful to take, take away the, the garbage, the rubbish in our hearts. No matter how terrible, no matter how stinky. And not only does he take away our garbage without complaint... He washes us, cleans our hearts, then He fills us with His blessings and provision. Don't you want to get to know Him more? Yet so many still don't know His name, nor His plans for their lives. At the end of this service, I, I want to give you an opportunity to get to know Him, to open your heart to Him and to all that He has for you. For many, this will be the most eternal decision you will ever make. Paul the Apostle in the New Testament was there once in his life when he knew about God, but he didn't know Him personally. It wasn't until he was rejected by his peers and lost direction that he cried out to God, who often uses sufferings and pain to get our attention. At that time, Paul didn't know who Jesus was. Oh, but he wanted to. Why, you can almost feel the passion in his soul when he said these words. He said, oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, even the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I might attain to the resurrection of life. Did you notice that? He added that he wanted to experience not only the power of his resurrection. He said, then, by the way, don't leave this one out. If it helps me to get to know him more, I'd like to know even the fellowship of his sufferings. He was saying, I want the blessings, but let me taste his sufferings too. The highs as well as the lows. Because if it helps me to get to know him better, I want to experience every aspect of who he is. And even the tough times, don't let me escape those. Some of you who are watching this Easter broadcast may be in the same place that Paul the Apostle was. You know about God, but you don't know Him personally. Well, what God did for Paul, He wants to do for you. Paul's life was radically changed from the inside out. And so many people want God's blessings, but they don't want more of God. They just want more of His favor. But you see, the favor of God 
comes out of a relationship with Jesus Christ, not out of a religion. It starts with you and me just hanging out with Jesus, getting to know everything about him. See, that's what makes the difference. Allow me to give you a, an illustration. Let's say you really want to become an Olympic figure skater one day, and you're invited to a very elite conference about the skills of figure skating with exhibitions from a few of the top Olympic figure skaters in the world. Well, you sit and you watch in awe as they demonstrate with such artful execution and moves, amazing toe jumps and edge jumps and triple axles, spraying ice particles like spectacular explosions under an array of colored lights. I mean, you, you are in this breathtaking demonstration. And then at the end, they skate right up to the students that are still in awe of what they just experienced. And the skaters say, there you go. Now that we're done, you go to the bookstore and you can buy our autograph signature skates and our, our, our outfits. And, and on the way out, there's some books that you can buy. So many of them run off to buy souvenirs, but a few stay behind. And to these, the leader asks, do you really want to become an Olympic figure skater? And he leans in a little more closely. Really? Is that what you really want? Why, yes, they answer. That's why we came. The leader then says, if you really want to become an Olympic skater, then this is what I want you to do. I don't want you to go out and buy my signature skates and our outfits. I want you to meet me here tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. sharp. You're going to do the exercises that I do. You're going to run the laps that I run. You're going to practice the movements that I practice. You're going to watch the films that I watch. And then you're going to eat what I eat. Then you're going to skate the patterns that I skate. You'll be coached by the same ones that coached me. And then you go to sleep when I go to sleep. And then the next day, you're going to get up and meet right here at 5 a.m. sharp. And we're going to do all of this all over again. You'll be sore. And you'll be tired. And you'll need to work through the pain until you're able to do the stretches and the weights and the exercises and the spins and the practices that I do. Then after a month of this daily regimen, you may not become yet an Olympic skater, but you will know what it takes to become an Olympic skater. You see, Paul the Apostle said, I want to know everything about him, not just the blessings, but I want to be all that God created me to be. And he knew that it wasn't just doing well under the lights, it was doing well when you're under the gun. That's where champions in life are developed. Let me ask you, when was it that you grew the most? When you were on a mountaintop or when you were in the valleys low? When everything was hunky-dory or when things were confusing and chaotic and everything was down, down, dooby dooby down, down. Come to think of it, there are very few passages, if any, that refer to mountaintop learning. <laughs> but there's hundreds of them about getting to know him when things are upside down. But it was in the valleys where I got to know him the most. It was in the valleys when I found out, without a doubt, that he's faithful and that he's trustworthy. David testified about that in Psalm 23. He said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because thou art with me. He found that the presence of God was undeniable in the valleys. Even though there's going to be struggles, remember this. Jesus will never take you through a valley wherein he will not give you something of equal or greater value in return. And that all starts with his presence investing in you in the midst of the valleys. God never wastes a hurt. He will breathe life into it and then use it as an ingredient for your future. New horizons and new vistas. And if you recall, it was Daniel, Daniel in a lion's den, that he experienced firsthand the power of his creator. It was in the middle of a fiery furnace that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego realized that God would never leave or forsake them. And 
on the other end of the furnace, they emerged with a faith that was virtually unstoppable. And there have been times when God took away for me, He took away from me things that I was leaning on. I remember going through furnaces like that. He would take away even relationships that, that I was depending on, leaning on. Why? So I would lean and depend solely on Him who never fails. Because sometimes we, we lean on people too much and we stumble because they move, they leave, they betray because people are like us, frail and fallen creatures. But rather than allowing me to lean on people, He allows me to stumble and then he brings me to lean on him. Now, that weaning process to get us off of people is often quite painful. But I love the saying that goes like this. Sometimes you don't know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you got. I remember several years ago I went through a heart attack. I've got three stents in my heart now. And, and then just then... I got sued by an atheist, and then I experienced deep anxiety and depression. And then last year, cancer. I remember when they were wheeling me into the surgery room, which, by the way, is freezing. I don't know if you've ever been to surgery. It's freezing in that room. I remember asking, and they only give you like a sheet and nothing underneath, you know. And so I asked the surgeon why it had to be so cold. He said, it's to keep the germs down. And I said, yeah, but if I froze that to death, that, that wouldn't matter, will it? <laughs> and then the anesthesiologist stuck a needle in my arm, and he said, in, tech, in 10 seconds, uh, you won't care. Good night. <laughs> but when they wheel you into the surgery room, you realize that all you got is Jesus. And you have to lean on him. And you have to rest in him. But you will. Why? Because you know him. It was during those days of recuperation that I got to know his love for me. I came to rest in his keeping power. And I made some lifelong decisions and corrections during that season in the valley. And I still keep them till this day. But those decisions, hard decisions, lifelong decisions, would only be made during the valley times of my life. Same with you. The reason this principle of getting to know him is so important is because it leads us to a second principle. You see, the reason you need to know him, and that's just so critical, here it is. The more you know him, the more you love him. The more you know him, the more you love him. You see his faithfulness, and you see how much he values you. And the more you love him, the more you trust and obey him joyfully. Oh, not begrudgingly. It might have been before you knew him. Maybe before you fell in love with him, you would kind of obey him begrudgingly. But no, once you know him, you love him more. And the more you love him, you joyfully trust and obey. Even in the midst of events that seem so impossible, you'll trust him more. You'll trust him more than what's happening around you. Let me put it in this way. In John's first epistle, chapter 5 and verse 3, he writes this. For this is the love of God. What is it? That we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. What? Yeah, this is the love of God, that you keep his commandments. And by the way, if you love God, his commandments, you'll find, won't be burdensome at all. What? Yeah, that's the love of God. And then he defines... What happens when you love him? His commandments, he's saying, become light and a joy to obey. What happened? Well, the more you know him, the more you love him. And the more you love him, the more you want to trust and obey. Let me illustrate. In our country, there's a strict law against throwing a plugged-in hair dryer into the water when your wife is taking a tub bath. <laughs> not good, not good. And there's laws against locking your kids in the refrigerator when they don't do what you want them to. <laughs> now, these laws aren't hard for me to comply with. I don't get upset if I can't do that. 
oh, I can't throw the hair dryer in the tub bath, or I can't lock the kids in the refrigerator. No, no, no. I don't fight with these laws. They're easy to comply with. Why? Because I love my family. I love my wife. And I love my kids. Most of the time. But the more you love, the easier it is to say yes to Jesus. When you take the time to know Jesus, you fall in love with him. And it's your love for God that increases your willingness and utter joy to trust him so much that obeying his commands is a thrill. And when you do, it makes his heart leap. It warms the Father's heart. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. There's a, there's a funny story of a lady whose uh, life and story may not be far off from ours, especially in these unpredictable times. She had barely enough money to live on, and she was living on food stamps. But one week, her food stamps ran out. But she loved God so much, and she trusted him implicitly. Now, trusting God is a natural byproduct of your deep love for him, by the way. You just want to. As the old hymn goes, trust and obey. There's no other way. It's no longer some difficult restriction to obey God, but it's a joyful conviction. It's a conversion that takes place. From being a difficult restriction, it converts into a, a joyful conviction. Well, back to that lady. She'd go out on, the front, on her front porch every morning, and because she didn't have much, She'd make a declaration in advance, in faith. She'd say out loud, thank you, Jesus, for providing for me today. Now, this would go on every morning, but she didn't have much. Thank you, Jesus, for providing for me today. Her neighbor, who was an atheist, would come out, and he'd get tired of hearing this every morning. So one morning, her irate neighbor came out, and when she said, thank you, Jesus, for providing for me today, he said, oh, shut up. God ain't going to help you at all. But like the blind man in the gospel, she just cried out all the more, thank you, Jesus, for providing for me today. <laughs> well, her neighbor thought and struck up an idea. It was shrewd. So as a trick... He went out and bought a bag of groceries, and early the next morning, he snuck up on her porch and put, put it there by the door, and then hid behind a bush. The lady came out unsuspectingly, came out in the morning, and just as she did usually every morning, she declared out loud, thank you, Jesus, for providing for me, and she saw the groceries. She got so excited, she said, thank you, Jesus, for providing for me today. And just then, the cranky neighbor jumps out from behind the bush and says, ha, ah, he didn't provide for you, I did. <laughs> she thought for just a moment, and then she declared, Thank you, Jesus, for providing for me today. Because not only did you provide for me, you even had the devil deliver it. <laughs> God can turn your trust into a miracle. And that's the favor of God, you see. He has so much more in store for you as you learn to trust and obey. The more you know him, the more you love him. And the more you love him, the more you trust and obey him. And the more you trust and obey him, the more you will gain the favor of God. I want you to know his heart this, this uh, weekend. I want you to stop for a second and, and think about it. Even in the midst of these unpredictable times, it's not for us to figure out who done it or where's the main switch that will turn all of this off? You know, in the book of Revelation, we find these words. He who has an ear, let him hear what God is saying to the church. And then in Matthew 11, 15, he, Jesus himself says, and he repeats it as it were. He says, whoever has ears, let him hear. Let me ask you this question. Can you hear what he's saying? Can you hear his call? 
For many of you that's watching, God is calling you to come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you've never made that decision, please do so today. He is the one who's knocking at the door of your heart right now. Right now. The answer is not in a vaccine. The, the answer is in the victorious person of Jesus Christ. The answer is not turning a switch off. It's turning on the ears of our heart. Because it's in Christ alone that we can put our trust. Do that today. It will be the most eternal decision you'll ever make. So how do you gain God's favor? You get to know him. Because the more you know him, the more you love him. And the more you love him, the easier it is to trust and obey. And when you trust and obey, you gain the favor of of God. He'll use even unpredictable seasons and even what the enemy tries to work against us, he'll use it for good. That's the favor of God. But the favor of God is not a religion. It comes through a person, the person of Jesus Christ. Get to know him. Let me close with a story. A wealthy man and his son loved to collect rare arts, uh, works of art. They had everything in their collection, from Picasso to Raphael to Rembrandt, Van Gogh's, very, very expensive. And they would often sit together and admire great works of art and talk about that and the history of it all. When the Vietnam conflict broke out many years ago, the son went to war. He was a very courageous man, but on one fateful day, he died in battle while rescuing another soldier. The father was notified and, and he grieved deeply for his only son. About a month later, there was a knock at the front door and a young man in uniform stood at the door with a large package under his arm. And he said, sir, you, you don't know me, but I'm the soldier for whom your son gave his life. On that day, he saved many lives. And he was carrying me to safety when a bullet struck him and he died instantly. Your son often talked about you and about your love for art. Then, then the young man held out his package. And he said, sir, I, I know this isn't much. I'm not that great of an artist. But I think your son would, would have wanted me, me to give this to you. Well, the father opened the package, and it was a portrait of his son, painted by this young soldier whose life his son had saved. The father stared in awe at the way the soldier had captured the personality of his son in the painting. And the father was so drawn to the eyes of his son that his own eyes welled up with tears. After a while, he caught his breath and he thanked the young man profusely and offered to pay him for the picture. Oh no, sir, said the young soldier. I could never repay what your son did for me. Well, the father hung the portrait over his mantle in the most prominent spot in his house. And every time visitors came to his home, he took them to see the portrait of his son before he showed them any of the other great works he had collected. Well, the father, this man died about a year later. And there was to be a great auction of his paintings. Many influential people gathered from all over, excited to see the great paintings and maybe have an opportunity to purchase one of them for their own collection. On a platform sat prominently the painting of this man's son. And the auctioneer pounded his gravel, uh, gavel and he said this, we will start bidding with this picture of the son. Who will bid for this picture? And there was silence. A voice in the back of the room shouted, could we skip this one please and maybe come back to it in the end so we can get to the, like, the valuable ones first? But the auctioneer persisted. Will someone bid for this painting, he said. Who will start the bidding? How's about $100? Anyone 100 200 
Another voice shouted angrily from the crowd, Hey, we didn't come to see this painting. We came to see the Rembrandts and the others. Could we get on with it, like with the real bids? But the auctioneer seemed determined. Who will bid for this, he said. Who will take the picture of this son? Hundred dollars, two hundred dollars. Just then, from the back of the room, the longtime gardener of the man and his son spoke up. He said, I don't have a lot, but I'll happily give a hundred dollars for this painting because I, I knew this family, and this is all I can afford. The auctioneer said, We have a hundred dollars. Who'll give me two? One person said, Give it to him for a hundred bucks, and let's get on with it. The auctioneer continued, I have a hundred dollars for this bid. Who'll give me two hundred dollars? The crowd was becoming angry. They wanted to get on with the more valuable investments. The auctioneer pounded his gavel. Going once, going twice, sold, he said, for a hundred dollars. Bang! A man sitting on the second row shouted, Good! Now let's get on with the real collection. The auctioneer pounded his gavel one last time. Bang! And then strangely laid it down. And the auctioneer said, This auction is now over. What? The people yelled in disbelief. What about the paintings we came for? I'm sorry, said the auctioneer, but when I was called to conduct this auction, I was told of a secret stipulation in the will. I was not allowed to reveal that stipulation until this moment. You see, only the painting of the sun would be auctioned, and whoever took that painting would inherit the entire estate and all the paintings in the collection. You see, said the auctioneer, the one who takes the sun gets it all. God gave his son 2,000 years ago to die on a cruel cross. And much like the auctioneer, his message today is whoever takes the sun gets it all. Because you see, when you Get to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The resurrected Lord now lives on your behalf, and He invites you even now to get to know Him, the one who loves you the most. So how do you gain the favor of God? Real simple. It starts by getting to know His Son. And the more you know Him, the more you love Him. And the more you love Him, the more you want to trust and obey Him. And the more you obey Him, you gain the favor of God, which includes not only His presence, but His invitation to eternal life. But all of this and all that He has comes through knowing the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You may be watching and you may know about Jesus, but you have yet come to receive Him as your Lord and Savior. If you've never begun that relationship with Him, today is your day. God may very well have orchestrated this whole season in order to get your attention and to draw you close to Him. In a moment, I'm going to return and I want you to join me in a prayer that invites Him in. But don't wait. Say yes to Him this Easter. And when you do, it will be the most eternal decision you'll ever make. Show me a face, fill up this space, my world needs you right now, my world needs you right now, I can't escape.
fill this space My world needs you My world needs you I want to take a moment to invite you to open your heart to Jesus Christ. It'll be the most eternal decision you'll ever make in your life. All of heaven awaits this moment, and all God has orchestrated is for this moment for you. It'll be a defining moment in your life, because you see, God's a gentleman, and he'll never force himself down on your throat, down your throat or into your heart, but he will, as the Bible says, he'll stand at the door of your heart, and he knocks. And if we will open the door, he'll come in. God wants this to be a commission. He wants it to be a cooperation so that there's a partnership, not something that's one-sided. Even though you might say, my past is a pretty checkered past. I've done things that I'm not proud of. Here's the cool thing. Jesus already knows that. And yet he invites you. He has... He has enough forgiveness and mercy to cover all of that. And you've got to let him do it. Let him start a brand new slate for you. And he'll begin to guide you, as the Bible says, into all truth. But he made his choice 2,000 years ago. The next choice is yours. And if you simply will say yes to him, he will begin his work in you. But he waits your reply to his invitation. If your heart is to be one that says, Lord, I want to open my heart to Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Right where you're at, right in your living room or wherever you are, would you pray this prayer with me? Let me lead you in this prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you that you came and you died for my sins that I might have life everlasting and gain the favor of God, not the judgment of God, the favor of God. And I know it begins with coming to know you as Lord and Savior. So I open my heart and ask you to be my Lord and Savior. I turn from my sins and I turn to you to receive you. And I, I say this so I can hear and so everyone can hear, but especially so you can hear, and by the way, so the devil can hear. Jesus Christ is my Savior. He is my Lord. I belong to Him. In Jesus' name I pray. And Father, that's our prayer. That's the cry of our hearts. Would you honor these prayers, Lord? And I pray that you'll embrace them and let them know that you and heaven have been waiting for a moment just like this. It warms your heart to see your children come home to you. May this Easter be that day when we come home. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you said amen to that, let us know in the comments. And, and uh, then follow the prompts on your screen. If you say yes, go there. Because we'd like to send you some things, some follow-up material that will help you so much in your first few steps with Christ. So please do that. Respond and we'll begin to exchange life together. We'll do it together in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, God bless you on this Easter. Happy Easter to every single one of you. And I'll, I know the, though it's kind of uncharted territory, Jesus still knows the way. In fact, he is the way, the truth, and the life. I hope you enjoyed today's program. And if it's been a blessing to you, would you please consider partnering with us so that so many more can receive God's Word in this community and around the world. Your donation will help expand this television program so that many, many more will come to know God in a deeper way. So join us. Send a donation today at the address on your screen or go to our website. So from God's heart and ours, thank you for partnering with us.
Bringing ideas to life is what Drafting Solutions does best. From computer-aided design, to concepting and construction planning, to even the permitting. Make your home renovation soar with Drafting Solutions. Call us today. Two, three, four. Play is very important. Play is good for you. Like vegetables. Except everyone likes it. <laughs> Studies show that play is one of the best ways to stimulate brain development. Play enhances coordination, balance, and motor skills. Play is helping me develop this spectacular.